God's grace and peace to you, friends. Today, we have come together to celebrate, in some ways, the way that Paul's ministry began in the book of Acts and also in Thessalonians. I invite you to consider what it must have been like to be in those early communities, to think about what it is to do the work that we are still called to do this very day. We're going to explore it, we're going to talk about it, and maybe even come up with some ways that we can do our part. Let us take a moment together and pray. You have turned the world upside down, God, bringing life out of death. You still shake things up, disturbing our uneasy peace by showing us a more excellent way. Open us today to be persuaded by your word that changes everything. Strengthen us by prayer. Empower us by your spirit. Orient us by your truth that we may confidently live lives worthy of your calling, changing the world with your love. Amen. Let us worship together. Today's scripture comes from both the 17th chapter of Acts and also the first chapter of the first letter to the Thessalonians. Here first from Acts 17. Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica where they were at a synagogue of the Jews. As Paul went in, as was his custom, he went in and for three days argued with them from the scriptures saying, this here is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, too. But the leaders of the Jews became jealous, and with the help of some ruffians in the marketplaces, they formed a mob and they set the city in an uproar. While they were searching for Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, they attacked Jason's house. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other believers before the city authorities shouting, These are the people who have been turning the world upside down. And they have come here also. And Jason, he has entertained them as guests. They are acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying that there is another king named Jesus. The people and the city officials were disturbed when they heard this. And after, they, after Jason and the others had been fined, they let them go. 
And so we move on to some time later where Paul writes to the same community that is forming in Thessalonica. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of people we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord, for in spite of persecution, You received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you in every place where your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to even speak about it. For the people report about us what kind of welcome they've had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus. Here ends our reading. Jesus calls us on the tumult of our lives, wide restless sea, day by day. Sounded, saying, Christian, follow me. Jesus calls us from the worship of the vain world's golden star, from each idol that would keep us saying. Previously, we found ourselves in chapter 3 of Acts, and all of a sudden we have jumped all the way to chapter 17. And a few things have happened in those 14 chapters that bear uh, a little bit of note. Uh, I'll talk about three specific, but there are a lot of good ones in there that we sometimes do in some years. This year, not so much. So here's some highlights. In Acts 9, Saul is on the way to Damascus and is struck by the power of God, loses his sight and is asked, why are you persecuting me? And Paul converts from being a Pharisee who attacks Christians to being an advocate for that early Christian community. In Acts 10, shortly thereafter, in a different part, Peter meets Cornelius and has an encounter with God in this sheet of meat. And God says, whatever I have said is sacred, you may not call profane. And so Peter begins his ministry to the non-Jews, the Gentiles of the good news of Jesus Christ. And then in Acts 13, Paul and Silas set out and begin their ministry not with primarily Jews, but with the Gentiles, the ones who have often been left out. So we pick up in chapter 17. Paul and others have traveled to Thessalonica, the capital of Macedonia. This is a Greek, mostly Gentile area. And without getting into all the specifics of history, how Rome conquered, etc., etc., the Greeks were a part of the Roman Empire after they had been conquered. But because of their loyalty and also their culture, they were allowed to function somewhat independently 
well, so long as they pay their taxes, didn't cause any trouble, and acknowledged Caesar as emperor, king, god, whatnot. They were respected so much that Rome actually stole most of their mythology and made it their own and called it Roman mythology. Much like Jerusalem at this time, Thessalonica was told, don't mess with the status quo. We'll leave you alone. Yeah, never works out so well for people. This specific Greek area in Thessalonica, the biggest city in Macedonia at the time, also has a Jewish population. Some are ethnic, many are converts from the Greek faith, if you will. The ethnic Jews, though, were considered visitors, if you will, uh, not equal to either the Greeks and especially not the Romans who ruled them all. It's kind of like having a visa to visit a place where the authorities can revoke it at any time and say, get out. It's problematic. Paul and Silas then enter into the temple, this big temple in Thessalonica, with folks that are somewhat worried about their status anyway. And Paul does what Paul does best, and he argues. Not in the way of picking fights per se, but having a debate, comparing scriptures, talking about it, persuading one another. Uh, you can see how this could be a little problematic in the community. If another pastor came up here and started saying things contrary to what we believed and did, you might take a little bit of offense. And some of their leaders, in fact, did take offense. In Paul's mind, he was just trying to be helpful. In their mind, he just kept calling them ignorant, that they didn't understand their own faith. He's a stranger. He's not from their community, and he thinks he knows better. And it stirs up a little bit of uh, anxiety, a little bit of problems, a little bit of worry among that community. And those leaders are rightfully nervous because they could easily be removed or arrested or destroyed. It's been done before for lesser offenses. And so they do what people who are afraid do. They go to the authorities and they say, he's causing problems and we're loyal citizens. We don't want to get caught up in this. Jason, a member of that community in Thessalonica, has been housing Paul and Silas, and so he even gets dragged into the situation. The mob that they've riled up demands action. The authorities come. They question Jason, and because Jason was just fined with others, there was no jail time. They were not hauled out or beaten or anything like that. He clearly had some status and was either a citizen in the Greek culture or in Rome and was therefore untouchable without his say-so in the law. But he still pays his fine and goes on his way. Paul and Silas are absolutely nowhere to be found, and it turns out when the wind of trouble gets stirred up, as is often the case, Jason and others say, get out before it's too late, and so they leave. This will be a hallmark of Paul's ministry, stirring up trouble and then running away before he gets caught in most cases. In some, he'll choose to go to jail to prove a point. But as they did this, Paul's ministry, Paul's words to this community had some bearing, had some weight. And it says that some of them were persuaded, this is the ethnic Jews, as well as some devout Greeks who had converted, and not a few of the leading women this group of Jews, Gentiles, converts, and even these important women will become the first church plant that Paul has in his ministry in Macedonia, where much of his work takes place. In Acts, Paul establishes the church in Thessalonica and then moves on, is spirited away to the next community to start sharing a message. So Thessalonians is there where we pick up that story. Paul has moved away and is now writing back to this community that has formed where he has created this first church. And this is how Paul went about planting churches. He would come in person and preach and teach, live among them, and then eventually move on to a new place and then write them letters for guidance, for encouragement, to remind them that they're not alone in this endeavor. 
Thessalonians is actually Paul's first letter, the earliest recorded church that he started. And Thessalonians was written in about 50 CE, from our best guess, 10 full years before any of the Gospels had been recorded on paper. So we have a backstory of how the church was formed at Thessalonica. So let's think about then how Paul instructs this church as he writes to them in his absence. He begins with thanksgiving to God for the church because he sees how God is working amongst them. He tells them that he keeps them in prayer, that he knows they're doing the work of the gospel, and he is intentional in how he praises both their faith and the works they are doing in the name of Jesus. This is so important, this praise, because as Paul says, it is in spite of the persecution. This early church, unlike what it is today, takes an immense risk in following and imitating Christ. It goes against Greece. It goes against Rome. And either of those have the power to destroy them. They take a dangerous, life-risking stand to proclaim Christ in the world. The meat of what Paul communicates to this budding community is you have become imitators of the Lord. This imitators of the Lord, the crux of Paul's message throughout most of his writing, sometimes gets lost in all of the rhetorical stuff he does with all his theologizing and things like this. But the point of it is that to imitate Christ means to become a slave or a servant to that very one. To follow Jesus like this means that your number one task is to imitate Jesus in the way he lived and he taught and how he died in the world. I'm not telling you anything new, but it's not easy. It's especially not easy for these small little communities with little support. Their support was basically just Paul and Silas. There's no funding, there's no building, there's no protection, they have no legal rights, just risk. So why would they do it? Wouldn't it just be easier to fall in line with the status quo? To follow the lead set by Rome to pay lip service to the empire? What could be worth risking everything for? Well, these earliest of churches met in people's homes that had some means. They were very small and lived a very different way, not just because of time and things like this, but in a very different way as a community. They were so close because their relationships with each other meant they depended fully on one another to survive. Each member of the community had to do their part or it all fell apart. There's this ironic paradox in the church world, as we know it at least, that the bigger a church gets, the more funds, space, everything, more members it has, the harder it gets to have enough volunteers to do the work of the church. You get lines like, I would help, but I know there's so many people already doing that, which rarely is the case. In these small collectives, people would share the caring of all of their community needs, food, shelter, healing, companionship, whatever it was. In short, they covered everything that was needed and they together provided for one another. They took great pride not only in just caring for their own number, but for anyone else that was in need. They found their joy in caring and living for others. And I don't need to tell you, but you know what it feels like when you can help someone else, especially with something they can't help themselves with. Most of this community would have had another job on top of caring for their community as it grew. But the true community, the one that mattered most to them, was the one they would return to after their regular lives, and it became the center of all that they were and they did. And their only goal was to imitate Christ in all things. So let's not pretend that this was a different 
world. Let's not pretend that somehow everything is the same. Let's not pretend that somehow they had it easy and we have it rough. It is wildly different. And yet at the same time, there are so many people who still struggle in this world. Inequality and inequity continues to grow. And in our day, it even makes Rome seem somewhat reasonable. Because of our awareness of the entire world and not just one small community, it also becomes different because it gets so much more overwhelming when we see all that there is to do. It becomes overwhelming to even begin this sacred call, the sacred work we were created to do. So let's take a whack at a few ways that we might imitate Christ and be a witness for this gospel of love in the world. You can do something like random acts of kindness or mercy, offering yourself as a blessing to those who need it. Inviting those who have been excluded, kicked out, forgotten. Taking care of those who no longer can care for themselves. Being intentional that we do no harm in the way that we live, that we don't live for just us but for the people on the other side of the earth. Praying for those in our immediate spheres but also those in other places, the far-flung reaches of the world where there is struggle. Fighting for justice when we see injustices take place. Calling out oppression in all its forms, especially when we have a power above those being oppressed. Building relationships, but especially building relationships with people who don't think like we do. Offering forgiveness and love to those who need it most. These are all small starts. And that's what these early churches did. They didn't solve health care or the climate change crisis in one pass. But they each did their part to do what they could to care for the sick, to honor God's good creation. They offered what they had and who they were to solve this. And so Paul encourages them, says, keep doing the good works while holding the faith and holding hope. Keep imitating Christ in all you do. So what are we supposed to do in this day and age? We don't live in little small churches and little collectives any longer. We have a building to maintain. We have things to do in this world, places to be, people to see. What can you do? Well, you got a phone? Maybe you call someone who could use a kind word, someone who could use to hear from you because they are lonely. Maybe they just need some company and you've got a little time to spare. Maybe we're more intentional, each one of us, about what we do with what resources we have. And when we don't need something, we use it to help those who do not have much, if anything at all. Maybe we find ways to offer our time and talent to people who cannot do what we can. Maybe you have a gift that might help others. Maybe you can offer forgiveness to those who made honest mistakes, or maybe you need to offer forgiveness to yourself for a blunder you've made in the past. No matter what it is that you start with, no matter how it is that you start to imitate Christ in your life, We are called to imitate that same love. We are called to imitate the way that Jesus loved those who he encountered, how he invited them in, and how in all things he was a blessing to those he was with. The reality is nothing in this world will change unless we too join that great cloud of witnesses and work together to proclaim the gospel of love in Jesus Christ. Amen.
and hearts together in a time of prayer. God, we are so grateful for the people you have placed in our lives, the people who you call us to be as your body, the people who have taught us your word and showed us your way, those who have lived the good news every day and are an example for us. We praise you for all of those who offer hospitality, who speak your truth but no one seems to be listening, who persevere in hope that you will use their faithfulness for your kingdom, for those who stand up for what is right and do so with joy, even in the midst of difficulty. May they be encouraged by your spirit and know that they are seen and valued, inspiring us as we seek to follow your way together. God, this day we hold in prayer all of those communities that are fractured, wounded, the places where relationships are damaged by hatred, violence, and fear, the places where buildings have been bombed and people scattered, where families and fellowships can no longer find common ground. We lift, in our, lift up in our prayers those who have been attacked for welcoming the wrong people, those who are in the wrong place at the wrong time, for those who are indiscriminately targeted for practicing their faith, for those who have been caught up in a broken justice system. We pray for all of those who are so threatened by change that they can see no peaceful way forward with their neighbor and they have no problem with the collateral damage it causes. We also pray for those who are insistent about justice, that they cannot stand by the status quo any longer, and so they cry out to you. May all people so love their neighbor as themselves, that they desire a better world, and develop the willingness to work for it, to let go of habits that harm, and to turn from idols in order to serve you, our true and living God. Help us to seek peace and to pursue it wherever and whenever we are as your people tempted to put your kingdom second. Whenever or wherever we prioritize the law and order of the empire over the resurrection life, set us right, give us strength, encourage us in your own way, God, until all of creation lives in harmony by the power, the gracious mercy you pour out upon us every day. Help us to walk that path that Christ walked, to imitate him in all we do, that we all may proclaim your goodness. 
It is with bold confidence in our hearts, in that very love that Christ poured out, that we join our voices together and pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. my friends, take that first small step. Imitate Christ in your daily life in whatever way you can. Start small, build, grow, that together we may all imitate Christ well enough to bring the kingdom of God close, that all may know the amazing power of love. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.